morning, everybody. It's good to be here. Um, we're going to start by reading our passage out today because I think sometimes it's worth like just remembering what it is we're talking about before we get going, right? So this is what it says at the beginning of John chapter 9. As he walked along, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, it is he. Others were saying, no, but it's someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. As they say at my school, the word of the Lord, and then everyone replies, thanks be to God. Everybody asks. Okay, maybe not everybody, but these questions come up in my life at least a lot. When tragedy strikes, people ask, why is this happening to me? Sometimes it's as simple as a child asking, why did my ice cream go and fall on the ground? More often, it's deeper. It's questions like, why am I sick? Why did they have that accident? Why isn't my partner better yet? Why was my child born with a disability? Why wasn't this person healed? Now, I've asked some of these questions myself over the years. Had a few opportunities for that. I've had some of these questions asked about me over the years. A few opportunities for that, too. And I've been asked these questions about other people over the years. See, as human beings, we are fundamentally vulnerable creatures. Ever since the fall, we've realized that being creatures who get sick and hurt and die is a scary proposition. So we've tried to find ways to protect ourselves from these things, t touching us or touching the people we love. We offer sacrifices to God or the gods. We show up for all the religious exercises. We follow our self-help books and make our New Year's resolutions and Marie Kondo our homes and try with all our might to make sure that the bad things don't happen to us by making sure that we fit into the category of good people. Which means we want the system of who bad things happen to, to, happens to to be fair. We want it to be just. We want bad things to happen to bad people and good things to happen to good people. And the bad things can just leave the good people alone. That would be great. It also means that when that doesn't work out the way we think it's supposed to, people often blame the God or religion or self-help program that they were professing to follow as if it's the source of their tragedy because that was the unspoken agreement they thought they had entered into. This desire to protect ourselves and this craving for justice leads us to look for the presumably bad things that someone else has done whenever tragedy strikes their life. We're searching for a talisman to ward off the evil, a rule book that will guarantee that it can't happen to us. If so-and-so was really a bad person before they got cancer, then not only was their cancer deserved, so we can make sense of its existence, but also, as long as we don't do that thing, then somehow we think 
will be safe or our loved ones will be safe from having the same thing happen to them or to us. It's all very human, this question, who sinned, this man or his parents? It touches on the very vulnerability we want so desperately to protect ourselves from. Now, I want to make it clear here. If you're asking these questions this morning, these are normal human questions. There's a lot of pain in the world, and much of it is or seems utterly unfair. This isn't new. The oldest book in the Bible is probably the book of Job. It's a book that's full of these exact questions, but it's a bit of a tricky book. You have to read it from the very beginning to the very end to actually realize that a lot of the answers that people give to the why questions are, uh, turns out a little bit wrong, or sometimes a lot bit wrong. And it's not just the book of Job in the Bible where you see these questions come up. Wrestling with pain and the why of hardship is this storyline throughout Scripture because it's a human question. In fact, it's such a human question that even Jesus asked why of God when he hung on the cross. My God my God, why have you forsaken me? Asking God why something bad is happening is not a sinful thing to do because Jesus did it. It's a human thing to do. But the scripture teaches us two key things, very broad brushstrokes here, about this question. The first is that when bad things and hard things happen, it's totally human to ask why. The second is, just because you ask why, doesn't mean you're going to get an answer. Why is a very human question to ask, and it's the question that the disciples ask when Jesus, ask Jesus when they see this man on the side of the road begging. The problem with this question, then, isn't that they're asking why. The problem is that they don't really see him, the man born blind. They look at the side of the road where a blind man is sitting, begging, but they look and they see a box marked beggar, check, and another box marked blind, check, and they think that they've got all the information. And so instead of seeing a human being, they see a theological question waiting to be answered. Because, you see, they're not asking this question in a vacuum. Instead, they're chiming in on a centuries-long theological debate that's going on here. And they want their rabbi's answer to that question. Go all the way, all the way back to the book of Exodus, and you have uh, God giving Moses and the people of Israel the Ten Commandments. And as God is doing that, as these Ten Commandments are being read out to the people, we hear, you shall not make for yourself an idol. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for their iniquity of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. So that says that if you sin, your kids, your kids are going to get punished. That's basically how they read that. But then, if you fast forward to the prophets, the books that were written hundreds of years after ex Exodus, they argue something completely different. The prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel, separately but at the same time, but in like two different geographical locations, both say more or less the same thing. They say, what do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no, no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine. The life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. So from this verse, we'd have to infer that it was the man born blind, not his parents, who had done the sinning. So you see, we have a bit of a problem. Um, there's this argument going on between the, these different parts of Scripture. And 
The other problem is that either way, the assumption here in this ongoing debate is that someone sinned. Someone has to take the blame. That isn't a question for the people who are asking this question. The disciples that day don't have any category where no one has sinned here. Someone has sinned. Their job is to establish who it is. But the problem is, this is a question about doctrine. And Jesus isn't interested in answering this question about doctrine so much as he's interested in actually seeing the person. This is what he says. As he walked along, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. That's right. Jesus sees the man and refuses to be drawn into the argument. For all that this is the most human of human questions, Jesus effectively says that this is the wrong way of thinking about the human being in front of them. As far as Jesus is concerned, the man didn't sin and his parents didn't sin. And this bad thing happened not because someone did the wrong thing or said the wrong thing or failed to do or say the right thing. Now, it's not that sin doesn't produce consequences. It produces all sorts of consequences. And we've been talking about this the last few weeks, right? About the ways our individual sin and our collective sin are responsible for all sorts of things that go wrong in the world. We know that these things exist, it's true. But the, in a case like this, I think what Jesus is getting at is that this constant search we have for why bad things happen and how to stop ourselves from ending up with the bad things by writing a really careful list is not helpful. It's not based on the reality of what's going on in these types of circumstances. And it's definitely not how we should respond when we see someone who is blind or sick or hurting or dealing with another disability. Because in most cases, for most of these things, there's no direct cause and effect for what's happening. The sin that creates these types of circumstances rampages through our world as viruses and mutated DNA and environmental toxins and freak accidents in ways not even 21st century science can completely understand or stop, as we have seen in the last two years. And more to the point, finding the answer to these questions is not necessarily going to be helpful. It won't necessarily heal the other person or get, protect us from something happening that is out of our control. Most importantly, it's not going to build a bridge of connection between us and them so that we can love each other better. So if who sinned isn't the right question, what is? What does Jesus say next? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me. I found this really interesting. Jesus says, Neither the man nor his parents sinned, but he was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. And then... Without missing a beat, Jesus immediately goes on to say that we, the, the collective we, he and his disciples, and by implication, anyone who becomes a disciple of Jesus between now, then and now, including us, we must join in to do the works of him who sent Jesus. This idea that the man born blind will have God's works revealed in him is mind-blowing for Jesus' original audience. The only options, remember, that they could think of for why he was blind had to do with sin. That was it. That was all they had. And some people still think about those with disabilities that way today. <coughs> there are so many people, like the man born blind, who have been written out of God's story, not by God, 
but by those people around them. This image behind me on the screen is of the Capitol Crawl, a political activism event that happened in 1989 in the US when dozens of wheelchair users protested the lack of accessibility uh, in transportation and in buildings in the United States by getting out of their wheelchairs and, and physically crawling up the stairs to the US Capitol building. I think there's like 87 steps. This is a big deal. In part, because of this protest, the law was changed. But do you know who managed to get exempted from the law? Churches and religious buildings in the US, who had long ago written off those with disabilities from having any meaningful contribution to offer the church. There's a very slow shift happening in this conversation today, but y'all are in a really interesting place because you have someone in a power wheelchair sitting on your stage preaching this morning. And that doesn't happen very often. It doesn't happen very often and so it needs to be said, this man who the disciples see as only able to serve in a centuries old doctrinal debate has something to offer to the work of God. The problem is that these words have often been twisted in one or two ways. The first way is that we start to assume that if it wasn't because of sin, then this tragedy struck because of some special purpose in store for the person in question. But we do it in this way that, that allows us to put um, those who have experienced tragedy into an other, into a separated space. It allows us to see their vulnerability without acknowledging our own, and to see their tragedy without catching our shared humanity. In other words, we assume that their purpose is special in ways that create distance and separation between ourselves and the other person, which allows us to continue to see past them instead of modeling Jesus and actually seeing the real live person in front of us, which is going to be a problem, right? But I think there's another thing that happens here. Because I think the second way we twist this is by thinking that special people get these special missions, leaving the rest of us free and clear from needing to do anything. And that's also not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is telling us that all of us have work that is given to us by God to do. Whether we're blind or not, wheelchair users or not, hurting or broken or not, whatever it is that's going on. Yes, God can and often does work through people like the blind man. Don't write them off. They've got something to offer. Those who are blind or have another disability or those who are queer or trans, those whose bodies or minds are different than the boundaries we have assumed are necessary to be able to do the work of God, they have something to offer. But also, if you don't have one of those stories, if you think your life is boring and uninteresting and has nothing special to offer, God can and often does work through people like you as well. See, this is what struck me as I was thinking about this passage this week. With nary a dropped beat, Jesus moves seamlessly here from the work of God in the life of the man born blind to the work that he and the disciples are also actively engaged in. It's not different work. It's the same work. It's the work of joining with God in what God is already doing, in what God sent Jesus to do. It's what some Orthodox and Reformed Jews now talk about as tikkun olam, the process of restoring the world to the way it was intended to be. This is God's work. It's the work that God has been involved in through big actions and small ones since he found Adam and Eve hiding in the garden behind their ineffective leaves. 
It's Jesus touching lepers and blind men and eating with tax collectors and prostitutes so that they would know that God's love extended to them. And it's the work that we are all initiated into through our baptism. See, check out what Jesus does here next. When he said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. In the main commentary we've been using this year uh, on the Gospel of John, Frederick Bruner spends a whole page talking about the pool of Siloam all the historical explanations of why this pool and what this word means and how it was understood by the early church. And the takeaway from all of that is that this washing has always been understood by the church as the man's baptism in Christ. You see, the pool of Siloam, or Shiloh in Hebrew, was linked in the Old Testament prophecies to Jesus, to the sent one. In other words, Jesus effectively tells the man born blind to go and be baptized in him. Now, remember, baptism is the way that the Gospels say we admit that doing life our way isn't working and we decide instead that we want to live life like Jesus showed and made possible, right? It's our expression that that's what we're ready to do. And so when the man born blind does what Jesus has asked him to do, he's deciding to live life according to what Jesus says. Now, that doesn't mean that he knows anything really yet about what it means to follow Jesus. He hasn't gone to Bible school, hasn't been a disciple for years, maybe hasn't even heard any of Jesus' parables. There's no profession of faith even in this story before he goes and is washed. All that happens is that Jesus puts mud on his eyes and tells him to go wash in this pool. And instead of ignoring what Jesus has said, or going to the well in the square and washing off the mud some dude randomly threw in his eyes, or leaving it on in the hopes that it would garner him like better, better money as a beggar for the day if somebody felt sorry on, for him, Instead, he, he goes and he does what Jesus says. He goes and washes in the pool of Siloam that means sent. Siloam that means Messiah. Siloam that means Jesus. And he places the part of himself that is most vulnerable into Jesus' care and trusts him with it. And when he does this, the man born blind, like the disciples, like any of us who have been baptized, is baptized by the sent one into the work of being sent themselves. That's the really fantastic, amazing, awesome thing that happens in this water. Yes, he comes back seeing, and, you know, that's probably cool for him. He seems to be happy about it. But that's not the really wild thing. The really wild thing is that he and us get baptized into this calling of being ourselves sent. No previous experience or minimum qualifications required. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, it is he. Others were saying, no, it's someone like him. He kept saying, I think this is really interesting, right? Like the dude's sitting right there. And they're talking over his head like he can't hear them or something. He kept saying, ah, that, it's me. Hi, it's me. I, I'm the man. And they kept going, yeah, but, yeah, but then how were your eyes opened? And he answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, 
where is he? He said, I don't know. This is like minutes after he gets out of the water. This sending that happens, like this is automatic. There are no new prerequisites. He gets baptized and immediately people start asking him questions about Jesus. And all he's got is what he already knows. I don't know. There's a lot of I don't know here, right? To begin with, the man doesn't have much of a story to tell. He doesn't have all the details about Jesus, right? He can't tell them where Jesus is at the moment. In fact, we read a little bit later on, he doesn't even know how to describe what Jesus looks like because he's never seen him. He can't tell them what color his cloak is. He got nothing. Jesus touched his face, but he didn't touch Jesus' face. He can't describe it. All he's got is this simple story. I was blind, and now I see. He doesn't have a fancy script, or a pretty diagram, or a long-winded sermon for them. He just has his story. So this is where I got to after sitting with this passage for the past month. Whether you're blind or you can see, whether you're in a wheelchair or not, whether you feel weighed down with tragedy or feel like your life is blissfully but maybe uselessly boring and uneventful, like the play me sign on this piano, there are three invitations, I think, in this text for us. The first invitation is to allow Jesus to touch us. When life has been rough and it feels like we've had to fight for every last penny, had to fight even to have our existence noticed to avoid being stepped on by those who tower above us literally or figuratively, whether we can see them or not, the first step in this process is being willing to be vulnerable enough to allow ourselves to be touched by Jesus would have been so easy for the man born blind to say no. So easy for him to put his arms up in defense when he sensed someone coming so close into his bubble. So easy to even turn away from the noisy, burly, scary crowd as he heard it approaching. Instead, he sits there and he lets Jesus get close to him and touch him, even though it was terrifying. And because of that, his life was forever changed. Will you give Jesus that chance? Maybe for the first time. Maybe once again. Secondly, there's an invitation in this story for those who haven't yet been to be baptized. And there's an invitation in this story for those of us who have been to remember our baptism. Baptism is, is this decision to start here on your journey with Jesus, even if you haven't figured out all the ins and outs of what that's going to mean for your life yet. To be clear, there's no limitations or prerequisites on who is allowed to follow Jesus John's readers would have thought that the blind man was surely disqualified from following. I have conversations every week with people who think that there are some people who couldn't possibly qualify for baptism or following Jesus. Some of them have been told over and over again that people who have bodies and minds like theirs, people who have stories and baggage and background like theirs aren't good enough to make the cut to be part of the Jesus story. They've been told that their gender or sexuality, their disabilities or trauma or addictions disqualify them somehow from joining the Jesus story. And I talk to other people who are convinced that there really are some people who are outside of the scope of this story. That unless people can overcome on their own or change or modify their bodies or minds and stories, then they can't be baptized. But at least part of the point of this story is that there is no way to be disqualified 
from this Jesus story. No way to be refused entry into the pool of Jesus. Only ways to miss out on it by thinking we're too good for it or not good enough. Because the point of this story is that following Jesus is an option for everyone who wants to take that step. You don't have to be special, and you don't have to have everything figured out yet. The invitation is open. And if you haven't been baptized yet, talk to one of us. Let's do this. You don't have to wait to have it all figured out. Roy's got a hot tub, too. In case you're scared, we're going to take you into Kemp and Felt Bay and dunk you this week. No. Roy's got a hot tub. We'll figure it out. Just, just thought I should clarify that. <laughs> that might be a prerequisite for some people, warm water. <laughs> and then finally, I think there's a reminder here that all of us who have been baptized have also been sent to share the message of Jesus with those around us. I grew up as a missionary kid, and there was always this idea when my parents went um, to talk to their supporting churches that people who were missionaries were some kind of higher-level Jesus followers, and I lived with them and knew a lot of missionaries, so I knew that wasn't true. But there, there was this sense that there was some kind of Christian hierarchy, and in this hierarchy there were regular people who sat in church on a Sunday and gave money to the church and to the missionaries and then could pat themselves on the back like they'd done everything they were supposed to do while the missionaries and the quote-unquote important people would go and do the scary work of telling people about Jesus. Except that's not how Jesus says it works. It's not what happens in this story. Instead, the man born blind, just like the disciples, just like us, is called to do the work of God, the one who sent Jesus. Each of them is called to tell those around them, wherever they are, about the way that God has worked in their lives, about what they have seen and what they have heard. It doesn't matter how much they know yet. The man born blind has got very little to go on at this point in the story. Based on the disciples' actions and questions here and in other places, you know what? They're honestly not much further ahead. But the man born blind is asked what, about who he is and what's happened to him. And because he has been baptized, his job is simply to tell the story. This man's story is really simple. I was blind. I'm the guy who used to beg here. That was me. I was blind, but now I see. It's basic. Yeah, there's a before and there's an after, but there's hardly anything in between. There's nothing fancy here. It's nothing that any of us couldn't offer ourselves. So if you've let Jesus touch you, if you've been baptized, what's your story? I'm going to post this on the Vox Family uh, Facebook page this week, and, and I want to hear, I actually want to hear your stories. You'll notice that I haven't really told any stories today. This is not how we usually preach at Vox. But this morning it was on purpose. Because there's only two stories I want you to take away from this morning. One, it, it, it's, they're, they're not the stories of Nathan or Rhonda or Taya or Roy or me. That, that's, that's not what I want us to take away right now. Right now I want us to take away the story of the man born blind. And then I want us to take the time to remember our own stories. What's your story with Jesus? What's the simplest way you could tell your story? Some of you are practiced at doing this, but some of you, it's been a long time. And it's important that we remember how to do this because the final invitation is this. Are you telling your story? I know that some of us have almost no story with Jesus yet. Some of us have barely met him. 
That's okay. Honestly, maybe you found this video six months from now on YouTube and it's the first time you've ever heard about Jesus. I don't know why, but I know that if, if you found this video on YouTube in six months' time and this is the first you've heard about Jesus, that you already have a Jesus story because otherwise you wouldn't be watching it still. That's the story you're invited to share. Others of us, <laughs> myself included, have a long and rocky history with Jesus. We're not even sure for ourselves what we think of Jesus some days. So how could we possibly be any use to anyone else if we tell our story full of doubt and uncertainty and questions? Maybe you too have a story like that. Maybe you too have a body or a mind that you were told was excluded from the Jesus story. This invitation is for you too. In all of its messy, unfinished uncertainty, this is the story you're invited to share. Because each of us is called to do the work of God, exactly as we are today. And as we'll find out next week, to keep learning from Jesus so that we can tell our stories a little bit better each and every day. If the worship team can come back up, I'll pray.